Coming up on the Paul Report, Rocco Sabuco from Pet Tropics in Charleston is here to talk about how to set up your very own aquarium. Then stay tuned for a special fishy feature with our friend Keith Wolcott. That's all coming up next on the Paul Report, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Paul Report this week. I'm your host, Kate Pleasant, and I'm joined by Rocco Sabuco from Pet Hi. Tropics in Charleston. Rocco, I guess, is our resident fish <laughs> expert yes. today. We've done a lot of dogs and cats and things here on the Paul Report, so I called up Rocco and said, let's do something about fish. You know, that's kind of um, an area we hadn't ventured into yet. So thanks for joining me today, Rocco. No problem. Glad to be here. I appreciate you coming. Mm -hmm. So first of all, let's start with, so I'm thinking about buying a fish, and I walk up to you in the store and I say, I want to buy a fish. What would you say to me? Well, first I need to know what size tank you have, but uh, generally people have at least a 10 gallon tank, something like that. And my favorite fish for something like that would be a zebra danio or a white cloud mountain minnow. They tolerate the small conditions well. They school together, so they're an interesting fish. It, it looks like there's something substantial in the tank. Uh, and they're just so hardy that they're tough to kill. You can't kill it. That's, that's my thing. I actually, um, I will admit several years ago, I had a small tank. I think it was a 10 gallon tank. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I said, you know, what do I do? What can't I kill is really yeah. what I said. And they said, Daniels, you absolutely can't kill a Daniel. And they're yeah. relatively ins inexpensive. Is that true? Yeah. Most of the time they're pretty okay. cheap. Okay. Um, and so how many of those, you know, they're small, right? You know, uh, maybe an inch or something. Yeah. How many of those could you put in a 10 gallon tank? In a 10 gallon tank, I'd say right about four would be a good starting point. Mm -hmm. You want to start slow. Um, you could maybe work it up to six or seven of them eventually, but four is a really good number in that tank. Um, but since they are a schooling fish, uh, if you get at least six of them, you see the more true schooling behavior out of them. Okay, so you know they're traveling together in the tank and Yeah, you'll around. get a tighter group of them that way. Okay. And so if you did have a you know a small tank or say you want to buy a bigger tank you probably would you recommend bigger tanks for inexperienced fish people yes actually it's easier to start bigger okay um, at least a 20 gallon is normally the easiest to start in it's just a ratio kind of thing a, a big problem it doesn't affect a bigger tank quite as bad as it will affect a small tank so uh, a 20 long is my favorite tank to start with for beginners it's long and it maximizes the 20 gallons. You get a lot of swimming space, so you can put uh, sometimes a little bigger fish than you generally put in a, like a 20 high or something like that. Okay, and so when you start an aquarium, what's kind of the general setup and what kinds of things do you have to go through to get an aquarium up and going for someone that's maybe never had one? Okay, the basic aquarium, uh, you don't always have to have a heater. If you wanna go tropical fish, you will add a heater to it. So that's an optional thing to have there. Um, you're going to, of course, have your filter, um, your substrate. If you're going to do just fish, it's fine to do pebbles, uh, any kind of rock. If you're going to do plants, you might want to do a sand or uh, fluorite type substrate, which is kind of a clay base. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll also need to have water conditioner to get the water ready that you're going to be putting into the tank. Okay. Um, and then once you, you'll just put the water in the tank and uh, I, I recommend that you use reverse osmosis water. Most pet stores will sell that or you can even get it at Walmart or County Market, some place like that, your local grocery store. And what's special about that? Uh, it has all the impurities taken out okay. of it. It's as close to just pure water as you can get. And because in our area we use surface water from the Embra River, um, it's a big it's a big issue with uh, higher ammonia after rainfall. It pulls all the extra dissolved organics oh, in, okay. into the water. So we have to condition that out. Yeah, if you just use tap water, a lot of times you'll have really high ammonia and uh, unstable pH in your fish tank. And you, you want to start off the right way, so it's worth getting the reverse osmosis water. Okay. It's usually uh, no more than 50, 60 cents a gallon. Okay, and so is when you start with you know, setting up a tank and things like that. Is there, should you be as a beginning fish person, fresh water or salt water? Is there one that's easier to do than the other? It is easier to start with fresh, but uh, there's been recent developments in salt that make it almost as easy mm -hmm. as doing a freshwater tank. Um, it definitely costs a little bit more to do salt water, so that's a factor. But skill, skill wise, if you're just, uh, persistent about your maintenance, you can do a saltwater as a beginner. 
Okay. So you go to the store, you get your filter, you get your tank. Mm -hmm. um, what do you have to do when you get it home and start setting it up? Does it have to sit a while? Do you have to get the fish some kind yeah. of quarantine? You'll want to make sure you've rinsed whatever substrate you're using so that doesn't contaminate the water. You'll fill up the tank, put your water conditioner in there, get the filter running. If you have a heater, get that in there so that you can let, and then you'll want to let it run for 24 hours to get any of the residual chemicals or anything that might have been from the production process out of the water. Um, and then from there, it's just uh, make sure that you have a stable temperature. Sometimes heaters, if they have a bad thermostat, they'll go up and down. So you check that in the first 24 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, uh, if you add some sort of bacteria starter to the tank, you can go ahead and add some fish right away. But what you'll want to do is add just a small amount of fish and let the tank cycle. Um, and you'll want to test test your water or have a professional test your water for you mm -hmm. um, uh, probably weekly if not every three days to monitor the cycle and then they can let you know when it's time to uh, do your first water change and when you can add more fish okay because what you're trying to do with a fish tank uh, is you want to treat almost like a water treatment plant uh, in the beginning you don't have any beneficial bacteria to eat any of the waste in the tank right uh, as you and what you're you're putting fish in there, they have that beneficial bacteria on them, and then you slowly let the beneficial bacteria balance out with the ammonia. If you put too many fish in there, uh, there won't be enough bacteria to eat the waste, and you'll ha it'll take your startup almost twice as long because it, the bacteria will take just a long time to catch up with the ammonia that's been produced into the tank okay. and the waste. All right, and you talked a little bit about heaters. Mm -hmm. um, does temperature change really affect fish um, as far as you know quality of life for them yeah um, a lot of times people will think that they don't need to put a heater in the tank because they keep their house at the temperature that they want the tank at right but uh, what's you'll still have fluctuations from the light on the tank and things like that even a two degree fluctuation every day going up and down will be stressful on a fish so you'll want to add a heater and keep it at the the highest point that that tank reaches and then you'll keep a steady level temperature to the tank and fish can adapt to a higher or lower temperature than what they're used to in the wild as long as it's stable and consistent if it fluctuates a lot it'll be very stressful on it and on them and it weakens their immune system kind of like us spending a lot of time out in the cold sure you can get sick and mm -hmm. you know weaken all that immunity that you have yep. so okay so what kinds of things um, are you putting in the water is there something that you do weekly or what's maintenance like on a fish tank um, stuff to put in the water you just have to put the water conditioner is the only absolute necessity that you put in when you're doing a water change whenever you're adding new water to the tank basically uh, optional things are you can put the bacteria starters in there um, but there's not really a weekly chemical you have to add unless you're doing plants and you want to uh, be supplementing them with a fertilizer of some sort Okay. Um, but we maintenance, I like to do weekly water changes, a small water change. Mm -hmm. Some people, that th that's not convenient for their schedule, and they like to do a monthly water change. And if you're doing a monthly water change, you want to do about a 10 to 20 percent change of the tank. A common misconception is that you want to change all of it and scrub everything. Right. But when you do that, you're getting rid of all that beneficial bacteria. So we keep it a 10 or 20 percent change just to pull the nitrates out of the water and just refresh things for the fish. Okay. So you want to have, you said, a heater and a filter and all that thing. So what about fish in fish bowls? You know, you see people bring them home, they win them at carnivals, whatever the case might be, their kid brings home a fish yeah. in a fish bowl. <clears throat> is that hard on the fish? Most of the time, if you're not doing it right, it is very hard on the fish. You can do that the right way. Um, you'll have to have live plants in there usually to help uh, put oxygen in the water and also to eat the ammonia and the waste that's in there. Um, and then you'll you'll usually have to change at least it's hard to do percentages on a fish bowl, right. but at least a cup of water a day you'd want to freshen it up with just to keep things fresh on the fish. Even with betta fish, you'd want to do that. They they tolerate it, but that's just because they can breathe air. Okay, let's talk about betta fish. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very popular kind of family fish. You know, people mm -hmm. think oh they're pretty easy to maintain. They're small, very colorful, they, beautiful. They're fish. colorful, beautiful. They're slow, easy to watch. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, and they fit in those little cubes. Yes. 
I've heard all kinds of good and bad things about those cues. So can you kind of enlighten us on maybe some of the misconceptions about betta fish? Generally, they should only be kept in the small environment in the sales type setting, just when they're only going to be there for a couple days. Mm -hmm. And it's not that stressful for them there because we're changing the water frequently and they can breathe the air. They're labyrinth fish, so they have the ability to breathe air, fresh air from the surface. So water quality doesn't affect them quite as bad, but they can still catch diseases and things like that. So generally when you want to get them home, you want to have them in at least a two and a half, uh, five or a 10 gallon tank is perfect for them. And I have plenty of customers that will have a betta fish in their community tank. They are a community fish. Um, they have a bad rep just because they fight other males. They're supposed to be mean fish, yes, right? <laughs> but they're not really mean to other fish. A lot of times when you get them in the aquarium, you'll have more of an issue with other fish picking on that big fancy tail and okay. they're a slow mm -hmm. swimmer. Yeah, you um, see some of those, you know, nicks in the tail yeah. and things like that. Is that what that's from usually? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And people, there is such an awesome fish that people actually set up. I have a customer that has a 55 gallon tank and it's split in half with just two betta fish in it. Wow. Just because it's that, that uh, impressive of a fish and if you put a lot of live plants and things in there like that, they're actually a very active fish. They're not quite as lazy as they will be around all the other community fish. Okay, so you can put them in a tank. <laughs> yes, with, you can. With other fish. And if you want to keep them in a fish bowl, that's okay, but it's the same thing we talked about earlier. You want to keep it fresh and keep changing things, but really the small containers are never a good long-term thing. You want to have it in at least a gallon of water. Okay, and that's not good for any fish, right? Uh, goldfish especially are terrible for being in fish bowls. They're one of the dirtiest fish there is. They have no stomach, mm -hmm. so they're just constantly digesting food. Um, that That's results in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, yes. I didn't know that. I did not know they didn't have stomachs. Most most goldfish do not have stomachs, huh. yes. It's that's, just a lot of intestines. That's different. Yes. <laughs> okay. So that's another thing, you know, goldfish. People think, I'm going to get my son a goldfish. Are mm -hmm. they good for inexperienced fish people? Not really, and most people don't realize that they're going to get very large, mm -hmm. and they're throwing them in a 10-gallon or a fish bowl, and within a year or so, that small goldfish is about that big. That's mm -hmm not quite what they thought right, they were getting right. into. I've seen goldfish, you know, if you keep them in the proper size tank, I mean, this big. They'll get, yeah, they'll get to be like koi, where they'll sure, be a, yeah. like a pond size mm -hmm. fish. And so obviously, you know, putting them in something small is not a good plan, right? No, most of the time, uh, if people want to do a goldfish tank, I tell them you're probably gonna want to have a 40 or a 55 gallon tank. Uh, and that surprises a lot of people, <laughs> but that's, that's what you want to do to get the true behavior out of that fish as well and they usually you won't get much more of a three to six month life out of them if you keep them in a small tank because it's just too stressful on That's them. why they die so often you know a lot of people say oh, I had a goldfish it only lasted a couple of weeks well it's <laughs> probably because it wasn't in the proper environment yes. so that's a good thing to note there but um, so you know, would you recommend fish as a good family hobby? Is it a good thing for families to do? Yeah, it's a great thing. And kids always seem to love aquariums. Um, and it's a good thing to get, you can give small chores to different parts of the family if, if you want to do something like that and keep everybody involved, have it something that the family can do. Um, and I like it because it's like living art. I personally do, right now I have is freshwater, but I used to have a saltwater tank. And right in the living room, it really is like art. Sometimes I would never have the TV on just because people would be happy to just stare at the tank for a while. Right. And so there's, you know, with those saltwater tanks, that's where you get the more tropical fish. Is that right? And they're a little more colorful, more colorful fish and people always want to have the Nemo in the tank and things like <laughs> the that. The clown fish, know, exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I like saltwater and I try to push people into saltwater as much as possible because it, it's intimidating, but it's mm -hmm. very rewarding as well because you can have a fish uh, I had my clownfish for I think six or seven years before it died. You have fish that die of old age. Sure, and yeah, so that's just, amazing. Yeah, it's it's interesting in the coral to have living things spreading across the tank and fish actually hosting. Mm -hmm. You can have more of a true ecosystem, even a self-sustaining ecosystem that okay. way. And what's more challenging about the salt water as opposed to the fresh water? Because I assume you still need heaters and filters and all that stuff. Like the maintenance is generally the same, but it's just you have to monitor different uh, parameters in the water like calcium and things and iodide and things like that uh, a little more carefully. Mm -hmm. Things that you don't usually even have to worry about in fresh water. Um, and just compatibility issues. There's not the base guideline of community or aggressive when you get into salt water. You just have to know what fish get along with okay. the other fish. And I assume you could consult your 
local pet shop or Worse fish it. expert to see <laughs> it's what about kinds the only of fish way to are do compatible. It. Yeah, before I would assume before you go out and drop some fish in your tank, you probably want to ask somebody if it's compatible with yep. the other kinds of fish. Because it's all about experience. We've been doing this, answering a lot of questions. Uh, uh, it's taken me, I've been in the pet industry for eight years now, just learning everything, talking to different people, and you learn from other people's experiences as well. What do you find that people tend to like about fish and aquariums so much? You know, you mentioned kind of the living art thing, but is there anything else, you know? Once you get it started up, it is generally low maintenance compared to other pets and low cost too. Mm -hmm. You just, most of the time a tank doesn't take up much more electricity than a couple light bulbs. So it's not really a big draw on the electric bill or anything like that. And you just have to buy some food every now and again. So it's a pretty cheap hobby once you have it going. And fish do have a personality, so they do make a good pet as well. Okay, and what do you do if you have to leave a fish for a week? You know, with dogs, you send them to a kennel, cats. Um, but what about your fish? It depends on the fish. They do. There are tropical fish feeders and things like that that you can use that are a slow dissolving block that you can put in the tank. That will work for some types of fish. Okay. Others that take a little more care, you might have to get, uh, they make like a rotating feeder that will drop in food every so before. often. Mm -hmm. That works for some fish and then other than that, sometimes you just have to get a neighbor to take care of the tank occasionally yeah, if you're yeah. going to be gone for longer than a week. But a lot of the fish too, if, if you research your fish, some of them can really go a week without food and it won't it won't harm them. Mm -hmm. You know, in the wild, they're not getting food every day like like we feed for right, them. Right. So they're, they're used to going a little bit without food occasionally. Mm -hmm. Is it um, a myth or is it true that fish don't know when to stop eating? Can, can you overfeed a fish? You can definitely overfeed a fish. Mo some fish have an appetite, some mm -hmm. don't. Some fish will stop eating, um, others will gorge themselves a little bit. And you can definitely have fish that are obese. I've actually lost a fish at the pet shop before because he got overfed. Wow. And most people don't know that and until it happens to you, you don't really realize. Sure, that, yeah, that. you did, don't realize that you can have obese fish. I. I I will, I have to admit here, a bad on me. I did kill a tank full of fish once by overfeeding them because well, they were yeah. a, a particular group of fish that didn't know when to stop. <laughs> so. And the problem a lot of times too is that there's a lot of food that we don't see then that makes it to the bottom of the tank. Sure. And that really quickly breaks down into ammonia and releases a lot of phosphates and things that will cause algae blooms or mm -hmm. just uh, illness in general. And that could have been part of it too, but mm -hmm. yeah, I a lot of times it is. I definitely did a bad one there. I was, <laughs> I was small and my mom told me to go feed the fish. So are there things you should avoid when you have fish? Are there certain things, you know, you tell people watch out for this or don't do that? Um, one thing that people forget about a lot is when you're cleaning the house and cleaning around the tank, you need to be careful of anything aerosol. Um, really, if you're going to use Windex to try to clean the glass, one drop of Windex in the tank is enough to kill a fish, almost the entire tank most of the time. It puts, uh, it's very concentrated ammonia a lot of times in the glass cleaners that will cause those issues. Um, so if you do need to clean the tank, it's better to spray something on a cloth and then wipe down the tank or use something safe like vinegar. Mm -hmm. Vinegar is the easiest, safest thing to clean aquariums with. Natural product. Mm -hmm. And that's, it even gets rid yeah. of hard water. That's good marks. to know, you know, something, I, I guess I wouldn't have thought of that, cleaning around the tank, getting Windex in there, so. Yeah, even uh, if you're painting the house and you don't cover the tank enough, even the fumes will be enough hmm. sometimes to damage the fish. Okay. What about other pets and fish? Um, you know, you always hear the cat and fish rivalry from way back when. <laughs> yeah, and really. You know, is that a thing? Really, customer-wise, I don't hear that very often. Okay. I have all of my pets love to watch my fish tanks. Uh, I will, I, even my reptiles, my bearded dragons, will stare at the fish if they're not trying to eat the fish right? through the tank. <laughs> um, but sometimes, uh, I guess one thing to be aware of just is if you have big dogs or things like that, uh, if they're clumsy, I have had people have tanks knocked over by their dogs before and that's, okay. you've got glass everywhere with a dog running sure, around. Sure, and fish and, everywhere yeah, and it's you problematic. Know, trying to pick them up and I'm yep. sure there's a whole host of I have a German Shepherd pup myself, so I'm uh, prepared for that one. Big and <laughs> jumpy, I'm sure, so they yes. can they can get to bounding through the house. So that's definitely something yeah, to get watching for. Doing puppy so. hot laps. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yep. So those are all good points. Well, Rocco Sabuco from Pet Tropics, we appreciate you coming on and enlightening us about fish. Yeah, um, like thanks I said, for that's having a, me. That's a topic we hadn't covered here on the Power Report before, so we appreciate that. But we hope you'll stay tuned next. I've got a special little feature about fish since we were just talking about fish. We went out and visited. 
um, Keith Wolcott. So stay tuned and check out Keith's Fish Tanks next on The Paul Report. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with The Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show or animals to be featured on our Adoptable Pets segment, please contact us by emailing kfpleasant at eiu.edu or call 581-6960. Or if you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. Did you know full episodes of The Paul Report are on YouTube? They can be accessed at youtube.com slash weiutv. Then just go to The Paul Report playlist and select the episode you want to see. Keith Wolcott has always been what you might call a fish fan. Keith and his wife Ellen live in Charleston and decided that they would take that fanism to the next level. I think I started when I was about 12 and I had fish for some years, but then had a break until, um, until I was in graduate school and I got a tank. And then uh, I, when we moved here I got a tank this size and I had this tank for many years, maybe 15 years. And then uh, three years ago I wanted a bigger tank, so I expanded. Although you can't take fish for a walk or teach them tricks, Keith says they make great pets. It's a kind of an interesting relaxing hobby. Uh, I have other hobbies that are, are more uh, active and so I like to have something that's a little more calm. And uh, Sit and watch them. I, I often grade papers right here and, and, and kind of look up and see the fish occasionally. Uh, uh, I just enjoy it. Dog and cat owners say their animals take on human characteristics, but Keith says his fish have personalities all their own. The, the loaches I like because they're intelligent and they're, they're, um, um, they have a pecking order, a social structure. So there's always an alpha loach, just like a pack of dogs. So they're kind of interesting to watch. Uh, I have two in this tank that about every two weeks, they spend two days fighting. <laughs> Now it's not real aggressive, but they swirl around chasing each other. They don't hurt each other, but they're trying to establish dom dominance. And so they're trying to change the pecking order. And uh, uh, they've been doing that for three years. <laughs> About every two weeks they fight. Uh, so it's just interesting to watch. Keith explains that even fish get their own toys and gadgets. It's a water bridge. So it's, uh, it's just a tube that goes down into each of the tanks and it's filled with water so the fish can actually swim up, across, and back down, and they do. Uh, especially the loaches, they're the more intelligent ones, so they, they are smart enough to figure it out. Some of them learn exactly what it is and they go back and forth regularly, even on a daily basis. Fish are a source of relaxation for Keith, but he also says that it's not all fun and games. It takes work to maintain all of his aquariums. I do water changes to reduce nit nitrate. Uh, there's a, there's a there's a 75 gallon tank here that I replace water with. I do 50 gallons just on the weekend. Uh, the also, the plants are eating the nitrate out of the water, so it's, they're eating about one-fifth of the nitrate. That reduces the work. So it's only a little bit of work on the weekend, an hour or so every weekend. Uh, not bad. Uh, but that's once it's set up and running smoothly. Keith highly recommends fish as pets, but says to do your homework before you get started. Oh, I'd encourage it. I think it's a great hobby, but you have to you have to learn about it. You have to learn the basics and learn how to take care of the water. You can't just put water in it, put fish in it, and forget about it. You have to monitor the 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 ammonia, and nitrite, and nitrate in the water and make sure the the bacterial cycle's working and everything's working well. Uh, but it's a great hobby. Have a video or photo of your pet doing something funny or absolutely adorable? 
We'd love to share it with our viewers here at the Paul Report. Email it to me, kate, at kfpleasant at eiu.edu, and you can see it on our show. Just make sure it's a video taken by you or that you have permission to share. For more information about how to get that video or photo to us, email me or call us at 581-6960. What? 